Hello learners, welcome to this video session today. My name is Furqan Qamar. I am professor at the Center for Management Studies in Jamia Millia Islamia. I also had the privilege of working as Vice Chancellor of the University of Rajasthan and the Central University of Himachal Pradesh. Also served as advisor education in Planning Commission and as Secretary General Association of Indian Universities. Today I am going to discuss and speak on the issue of the importance of research and what are the prerequisites for promoting high quality research in higher educational institutions. I am sure that you all must know or you will already be knowing that universities have three interrelated functions that they need to discharge. The first function is that they need to generate knowledge. This is what makes universities different from school education. Universities are not only into the business of communicating knowledge or transacting knowledge, but they are essentially aimed at generating new knowledge, opening new frontiers, adding to the existing body of knowledge. And these are all the functions of research. These we do through research. Of course, the second important function of the universities are that you communicate, you transact knowledge for the benefit of your learner. And essentially, it should ideally be a partnership between research and teaching and in that case, the teaching becomes uh, very relevant, directly appropriate and contemporary, enabling students to become able to solve real life situations. So that should be the focus of the teaching. The third dimension of the research is that whatever universities do, either through research or by preparing uh, students through their teaching abilities, the universities should be able to contribute for the general development, social and economic development of the communities nearby, and also for the larger good of the whole nation and of the uh, world as a whole. So thus teaching, research and extension or community engagements are important component of higher education. Amongst these three, many experts considered that research is most critical and most crucial dimensions of a university life. You take away research from the universities and universities would be anything but higher education institutions. Now there are certain details that we need to see as to why research are important. Now, these days, everybody speaks about the national education policy and what it prescribes. We know that the national education policy 2020 is targeting to take the participation rate in higher education from the present 27 percent to about 50 percent by 2035. The national education policy also aspires to have a system of education that India is second to no other country in the world. Now, India would be second to no other countries in education only if India is able to produce original research, see that these researches are monetized, these researches are commercialized, and they lead to not only the registration of patents, but they also lead to the commercialization of those patents. It is therefore not surprising that the National Education Policy 2020 mentions the idea of research and importance of research in over 37, 38 pages out of the six page document. And a number of academic reforms initiative that it proposes is also aimed at or also aimed at promoting research in higher educational institutions.
Now the essential of the research that when a country or when a university is able to produce better high quality research with the help of their teachers and also with the help of their research scholar and other students on the campus, we could say that there are some prerequisites which need to be uh, addressed. And these prerequisites are essentially classified into three broad groups. We need faculty, we need funds, we need freedom. And all of these three dimensions have also been emphasized in the national education policy. Let's first take funds as a prerequisite. Research today has become very, very expensive proposition, particularly in the disciplines of science and technology, where you need to set up labs and other infrastructure for conducting your research and doing your experimentation. Not only that, a general infrastructure development which makes or creates a good teaching learning environment on campus plays a very critical role in motivating people. These days we see that many universities world over also provide incentive, often either through uh, speedy promotion or through monetary incentives to people who publish high quality research. So all of these things taken together need money, need resources, need funds. And the national education policy talks about the creation of a national research foundation. The idea of the national research foundation as given in the national education policy is that it will provide access to funding for research on a competitive basis. People who aspire to conduct research in certain areas need to apply to the National Research Foundation and National Research Foundation would sanction or provide adequate amount of funds to enable the university and the faculty to take up the area of research of his or her choice. The policy in fact makes sure that this National Research Foundation will provide funds over and above the funds which are already provided by many other existing institutions like the University Grants Commission for General Higher Education, the DST, DBT and CSIR for scientific research or by any other funding agency that exists at the moment, they will continue to provide funds, but over and above this National Research Foundation would provide additional funds. This National Research Foundation shall have a corpus and out of this corpus, this money would be provided. So fund is a very critical aspect for promoting research. The second thing which is all the more critical if you have all the funds available, but if you do not have capable people to take up research, then despite the availability of funds, the researches would not take place. Which are the critical resources? These are the human resources. And primarily these resources comprise of the teachers or faculty in higher education. About faculty, there are a few uh, important things which, are, uh, which need to be kept in mind that we need adequate number of teachers in a university and in that way for the nation as a whole. I think the adequacy of the teachers is measured usually in terms of the student-teacher ratio or student per teacher. If we analyze that what are the student-teacher ratio for the best world-class universities around the world we find that this ratio varies between 8 to 12. Our national education policy has not prescribed any specific number of the student-teacher ratio, but it says that student-teacher ratio should not become too high. Because higher the student-teacher ratio, the teachers are more busy in the teaching activities than taking up research. So presently, we have about 
28 million or 2.8 crore students in higher education and we have about 18 lakh teachers so you can calculate the number of teachers per student or number of students per teacher and in India in higher education our student teacher ratio are is still higher and that is where the policy says that that number should not be high that number need to be kept within a certain limits so policy prescribes about uh, the uh, adequacy of the teacher in addition to the adequacy of the teacher what is critical is the quality of the teacher and from the quality of the teacher's point of view, the draft national education policy was more specific. And it said that no teacher should be appointed on ad hoc or contrary or on a guest faculty basis. Rather, the teachers should be properly appointed, properly recruited on full time basis so that right from day one, they could be engaged into their teaching, research and extension activities. So quality of teachers are that the teachers are with suitable qualification in terms of the norms that has been prescribed for each department. At the same time, the quality of the teacher is also decided on the basis of their dedication and commitment to engage effectively into the teaching and research activities. So the focus should be on attracting the best talent that is available. Of course, I cannot say that the best talent because the best perhaps is not a term which will apply because we have to select people from within the talent pool that is available within the country. And what is that talent pool? The people who have qualified junior research fellowship or net examination or have completed PhD or have qualified the gate examination. These are some of the tests that determine the quality of the teacher and it is only these people who are appointed. Many institutions also give some weightage, some preference to some foreign training by the students so that they could bring in the best techniques from anywhere in the world. So quality and the commitment of the teacher is extremely important. And the third dimension for creating that ecosystem is freedom, which in the academic circle is also known as the idea of the university autonomy. When we say autonomy, that does not mean autonomy or freedom to do whatever an individual or whatever a university wants to do but the consensus on the definition is that by autonomy we should mean the freedom to do what we are expected to do. So what a university is expected to do? The university is expected to do teaching, research and extension activities and to be able to do these things, the universities need freedom, need autonomy. And that is why we see that over a period of time, there have been a lot of discussions and deliberations as to how to make universities free and autonomous. Of course, the other side of the coin is accountability. And quite often, quite often, Policy planners insist that autonomy is fine, but then the universities should also be held accountable. Now, how do you hold a university accountable? One way could be that you hold teachers and researchers of the university accountable on the basis of whether they follow certain laid down processes and procedures or not. But I think the best accountability could be ensured through whether they have been able to produce the output and the outcome. So move from the procedure-based accountability to outcome-based accountability and provide the institutions and provide the uh, individual faculty and researcher the freedom to do research on an area of their preference, of their choice. Sometime linking research to immediate 
needs of the society and immediate needs of the uh, economy may not be a good idea. Though it might appear that it makes researchers more relevant, but then in case of fundamental research, foundational research, you find that quite often the researchers themselves do not know that what will be the practical applications of research unless a long time has elapsed and then somebody realizes that no, the finding of that research could be used in these, these, these activities. So funds, faculty, freedom, prior to national education policy, lately the government itself have been emphasizing on that if we cannot give autonomy to all institutions, we shall give autonomy to some select institution and therefore the idea of the graded autonomy came in. So like IAM's acts were changed to make them fully autonomous and all the decisions be taken on the board level. Similarly, it was said that those which are A++ graded or A plus graded institution by the National Assessment and Accreditation Council. The National Education Policy also emphasized at many places about the idea of this university autonomy and that we think need to be implemented. Once these things are in place, then there are certain other things which facilitate research or academic research. One thing perhaps I did not mention before that unless a department or unless a unit of the university has critical mass of the faculty, that does not generate interest in research. So every department need to have at least a minimum number of prescribed faculty so that they have a critical mass. Second thing is, like it was emphasized earlier by many policies, and now in this policy, that we cannot find solution to any single problem facing the world or even facing an individual or facing a nation by the knowledge of a single discipline. So this compartmentalization of knowledge is not good for research. New ideas come in when the boundaries between the disciplines are porous to cite the word, word that Professor Yashpal used in his report on revival and rejuvenation of higher education. There should be intermingling of disciplines so that in an intermingling of discipline, people get new ideas and they explore further and they create new knowledge and they add value to the existing body of knowledge already been attained. Now the researchers come at the fringe or at the uh, corners of disciplines. So like you are seeing that all those technological advancement in information communication technology, in the medical sciences, in the diagnostics, in the medical uh, implant, etc. You are finding that they are coming due to interdisciplinarity, intermingling of science, engineering, technology and of course the commerce and businesses would also come into play when it comes to commercialization of these ideas. So focus should be on producing kinds of people with multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary orientation. And that is where the national education policy comes into picture where it insists that all higher educational institutions need to be multidisciplinary. Now, India is one such country which has largest number of institutions, more than 1,000, close to about 1,100 universities, and more than 51,000 colleges and standalone institutions together. That makes the single largest system found anywhere in the world. But an overwhelming proportion of these institutions are a single discipline college or a single discipline institute. So the policy talks about making colleges and institutes and universities of the large in size, taking them to a minimum of 3,000 to 5,000 enrollment. There should be many disciplines, many departments in a college 
so that people are able to pick and choose from many disciplines. And then the remaining two years or the next two years they spent diving deep into a discipline so that they specialize and super specialize in that area. So I think the policy works on this philosophy of enabling students to have a taste of many subjects and then focus on a particular discipline or a particular subjects for completing their education. This will make a holistic individual. This will make an individual which has outlooks that goes beyond a particular discipline. So multidisciplinary becomes very, very critical and important for promoting research. So increasing the number of research scholars and research students is very, very critical and very, very essential. And it is the partnership of the faculty and the research scholars that many new publications come out of the system. So the focus should be on enlarging the base of the research scholars on the campus. While world over, even undergraduate education has become research based, where students are required in a supervised mode to take up some research, uh, start thinking about research, start doing, if not a very high cited publication, but some publications. And in case of the postgraduate education, the research component should be increased more. Uh, the idea is that most of the people who do their post-graduation uh, and PhD, they are likely to be either in research organization or in the academics. And that is where uh, training them, uh, exposing them to the field of research becomes very, very important. So I think we need to expand postgraduate education. We need to expand PhD level education. And, in order, and we need to integrate a research component certainly in the postgraduate courses, but also to the extent possible at the undergraduate level to create a culture. I think uh, I would like to conclude by saying that there is one point that worries us, you must have all heard, and that point of worry is that despite being the largest system of higher education, how come that there are very few institutions from India which are appearing amongst the top 200 list or top 100 list of the world-class institution or the best ranked universities. The measurement for categorizing institution as world-class gives a very high component to research. So I think we need to focus on research to enter into the league of the best institutions of the world. Also, at the same time, a question that often worries is that how come that most people who have got Nobel Prize in literature, in uh, economics and in sciences from India Barring two exceptions, all of them left India after their first degree or even after their second degree and pursued their further training somewhere else in the world. And by working there in the universities and academic institution in those countries, that these people got their Nobel Prize or the highest honor which any academics can ever think of. Now the question is that why can't we in India create an ecosystem that if we have people with such a good brain that they could get their Nobel Prize by working abroad, why can't we have that ecosystem that these best brain are able to win Nobel Prize by being in India and by producing research of such a world class that makes an impact and that makes a difference. So Indian minds per se is not bad. There is also no dearth of any talent in India. Indians are willing to work hard provided 
we are able to create conditions and facilitate their research aptitude. My whole purpose of this lecture was to involve you in this aspiration that make India world class in terms of the number and outcome and impact of research. One example that you could understand that in India there are about 18 lakhs teachers teaching in higher educational institutions. If everybody produced even one paper every year, then India's research output would have been about 18 lakhs research paper per year. Our real and actual numbers are far less than what it ought to be. So I think we need to work hard to create this research culture and create that ecosystem where everybody takes pride and everybody wishes to contribute in this research process. With these words, I conclude my lecture and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.